Yeah, well, you know, as I was growing up in the hood, you know what I mean, becoming a gang member from my hood because all my family were gang members, my brothers and sisters, my little brother, you know, coming up in the hood, you know, um, I wanted to be what they called the hood star because of the fact that, you know, we had a lot of homies from the hood and a lot of them did a lot of treacherous things, you know, some of them robbed banks. Um, we had a, we had a crew of bank robbers, we had a crew of drug dealers, and then we had a crew of dudes that put in work. You know, I was the type of individual where, you know, I didn't want my older homies to get at me and tell me, hey, you know, you ain't putting in no work, you know what I mean, you ain't doing what you're supposed to do, you know. I didn't really want them to tell me anything. When my older homies came, I got it to a point where at the age of 15, I was doing things that my homies were 21, 25, they were doing. Because of the fact that, you know, I got schooled by a lot of older cats. And my neighborhood where I'm from, which is Cantarranas, you know, we're real involved with a lot of, with a lot of shit. You know what I mean? We're involved with a lot of, you know, uh, stuff like, uh, you know, um, we're like the number one gang in the Southeast for a long, long time. We had the most big homies, which are, you know, the guys in charge. And um, we were, you know, destined to run the area for many, many years. But like when I was 15 years old, we had maybe like seven youngsters. And what happened was, you know, we went through one summer and everybody got busted. Everybody was busted. I was the only one out there by myself, you know what I mean? And I was going at it with maybe like three or four different gangs. I was getting shot at every weekend. You know, I can remember occasions where I was walking into the Denny's one time. I turned around and a guy shot at me seven times, point blank range, missed me, you know, shot at me inside Denny's. You know, the cops came, I took off running, you know, back to my hood. and. You know, I knew this guy that had shot at me seven times and I was only 15 years old, you know, I already got shot at like nine times, nine different occasions. But this one occasion that I got shot at at Danny's, you know, it was really, really close, you know, and that was like the first time that I really wanted to pick up a gun, you know. So I wanted a gun and I didn't care where it came from, uh, what it had on it, you know what I mean? It didn't matter, you know, but I was young. I ended up paying, I think it was $40 for a 22 uh, revolver. Yeah, it, was, it was a real small gun. But I remember I got it, you know, I cleaned all the bullets off, I loaded up my gun. I was 15 years old, it was maybe about 1989, maybe 1990, so things were really popping in the hood. Well, I was by myself, you know, and one day I'm kicking it, you know, I'm by myself and I'm thinking, you know, uh, my homies are getting shot left and right, my older homies are getting shot left and right, and I'm the only youngster out there, and you know, the, the, the pressure's on me, you know, it's on me, you know, well, what am I gonna do? I'm thinking, what am I gonna do? You know, I was already selling PCP and I was only 15 years old. But I used to hide my PCP inside of three coconuts that my grandmother brought from Hawaii, you know. She used to smell it because it was these three coconuts used to sit on top of her TV. And the coconuts, the head used to unscrew. So I used to unscrew the head and put all my bottles of juice inside the coconut and close it up. My, grandfather, my grandmother used to be sweeping and she could smell the PCP, but she didn't actually know where it was coming from. What it was coming from was it was coming from the top of her TV inside her coconut. So I, I left it there for months. I used to do, you know, deal dope out of her house. And my grandmother, you know, she knew everybody from the hood. All my uncles were from the hood, you know what I mean? And I remember I came home one day and my grandmother stopped me at the door, you know, and she's like, uh, you know, I hear you're carrying a gun, you know, and I was only 15 and I, I didn't lie to my grandmother. I told her more that, yeah, so what happened with my grandmother, you know, and she searched me down, she'd grab my gun and she'll put it away. Now it was hard to get my gun, but due to the fact that I had a younger uncle that was from my hood, you know, sometimes my grandmother would take his drugs and I knew where his drugs were at. I also knew where the needles were at. You know, the, the ones that used heroin, you know, they wanted me to get needles. My grandma was diabetic. I knew where all the needles was at because I was a youngster. So I used to go get the needles. Before I gave them their needles, I used to want back my gun. So I used to tell my uncle, okay, well, you go get my gun. I'll get you the needles, get you whatever you want from grandma's house, you know, because we also had what they call black box. And that black box was stuff in there that was donated to my uncle because he was in the feds doing time. The black box, nobody had, was able to touch that box. No one was able to get money out of there. You know, you could put money in, but you could never take nothing out, you know. And next to that black box sat the rigs and everything else that my grandmother used to hold. So I used to sneak in there, go in there and get them, and then give my uncle the rigs and he would give me back my gun. I would give him back his drugs. So I did that for like a good summer, you know, and then the end of the summer was coming up, like three of my homies had got killed, you know, and I was out there putting in work, you know, I was putting in work, putting in work. Sometimes I would do things out there where I would come home and I wouldn't want to leave for like two or three days because I was afraid of what I did out there. You know what I'm saying? Some of the things I did out there were, were very, very treacherous. You know, a 15 year old shouldn't even see things like this, but due to the fact that I grew up in a gang member and a gang banging family, you know, I knew right and wrong from the beginning. You know, the only thing that I didn't know was 
I was so young that I would always brandish my gun. I would brandish my gun. I would show people my gun, show people my gun. And my older homies were getting at me like, hey man, that's not what it's for. But I was so young that I would keep brandishing my gun, brandishing my gun. Well, what happened was is that I had my gun on me and we were kicking back in my hood and we're like, we're on the main street, we're on, we're on our main street is Danby and Blue Jay in my hood. And it's kind of, you know, it's kind of difficult to get in and out of there because of the fact that the streets are so small that we used to box people in. But at this time I was selling PCP and people were coming from everywhere to buy the PCP. I had it bumper to bumper in the hood where people would smoke and just get stuck right there. They'd smoke a dipper and their girlfriend would end up getting naked. The cops would come, you know what I mean? And I was only 15 years old. You know, people would knock at my door two, three in the morning. My grandmother would answer and they would say, hey, I want a 20 dip, you know? And I'd get in trouble because my grandmother knew that I was dealing PCP. But she was asking me, you know, are you dealing PCP? Because people are coming two, three in the morning. Like my older homeboys and homegirls would come and they'd be all spaced out on that PCP and they'd come and say, yeah, give me a 20. And they'd be asking my grandmother. My grandmother would go in the garage and whoop my ass real quick. And they'd tell me, hey, they want you outside. So I'd go outside and deal dope. You know, I did several things out of my house. I dealt dope out of my house. I shot at people in my house. You know what I mean? I, I remember one time I came home. Well, one time I went out there in the streets and I was out there gangbanging. I ended up seeing this guy from the enemy hood, and I seen him in his car. I drove up on him, broke all his windows, shot at him like three times. I got away, I went and partied at my homie's house. Well, the next morning when I came home, I see my grandfather in the front yard and he looked kind of mad. So I walked up, he got a big old stick that he had cut off a tree, and he peeled it down with his knife, he sanded it, he shellacked it, and then he let it sit in the sun and let it dry. It was for my ass but I didn't actually know why he was so upset. So when I get home, he tells me, hey, what the hell is going on here? You know, somebody shot the house last night, come here in the front yard. So he took me to the front yard and in front of the house, he's showing me the holes and he shows me one hose and he goes, look through that damn hole, you know? So I look through the hole and he says, you see what I see? And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm like, nah, he goes, the fucking dogs are playing in the backyard and I'm in the front yard. So in other words, from the front yard, I looked through my house and I could see the hole that went all the way through my house, all the way to my backyard where the dogs were playing. So my grandmother, you know, my grandfather, you know, he whooped my ass, whooped my ass. And you know, my grandfather used to think that I was the only one out of all his grandsons and his sons that didn't go out there and do the deed. Because I was the type of individual that if I did something, I kept it to myself because I felt that if you talk about it, it's like doing it all over again. So my grandmother schooled me when I was a youngster, you know. She taught me how to read people, you know. She taught me how, more or less how to be a man, you know what I mean? I was made by a woman and raised by a woman. And, you know, she schooled me in, in every fashion you could think of, you know what I mean? Uh, when she's, I used to go do missions, you know, my grandmother used to ask me, you know, don't go with anybody, go by yourself. You're gonna do it by yourself, only you can tell on yourself. So I grew up in the gang environment. This is advice from your grandmother? Yes, my grandmother. My grandmother gave me advice due to the fact that my grandmother had like seven sons that were gang members. Oh, she did? Yeah, she had one son that was, you know, one of those guys from the mob. You know, he was my uncle and that was her son. So she knew all the ins and outs of gang living. You know, when I lost my mother and she, my mother and father when I was a child, my father was from my neighborhood. He was big Casper. I'm little Casper. My mother was out of Norwalk, but they got together, had me and my brothers and sisters and I knew in the beginning of life when I used to go to my grandmother's for Christmas and Thanksgiving, I knew eventually that me and my little brother were going to be from this, this gang that was so in tight in, inside my family. How did you lose your parents? I lost my parents at the age of 13. I was already kicked out of school. I got caught with an ounce of weed at school. I was about 12 years old. They gave me what you call independent study. Independent study, you know, um, you take your books home from school, do the work, and then you mail it back in. Well, it was about middle of June and me and my mother and my father and my aunt and my niece were walking, coming from the bus stop, we were walking across the street. We only had to cross two streets and we would be at my house. We could see my house from the bus stop. But what happened was we were crossing the street and it was my mother, me in the middle and my aunt on the side of me and then my dad and my, with my niece on his shoulders and his friend. Well, I remember the light turned green, it said walk. So we started walking across the street all I felt was a hit in my chest. When I fell back, I seen the truck go by. He struck my mother first. My mother went up in the air. He hit my aunt. My aunt went under the truck. He kept going. My mother fell back on the hood, rolled off the hood, and he ran her over with the back tires. 
all along my aunt was stuck under the truck her arm was stuck in the wheel shaft and when this guy stopped maybe about 80 feet he was still trying to take off but he couldn't take off because my aunt's arm was stuck inside the wheel shaft now i remember my father was running from my mother to my aunt back and forth and you know they got hit by that truck and it kind of like ripped their clothes so my father was trying to cover my mother go to my aunt and he was going back and forth back and forth back and forth and then we lived right across the street and my older brother and sister came running out the house my aunt was dead on the scene my mother died on the way to the hospital now when my mother died you know they took us in this little room in the hospital and they told my father that what happened to my mother and my aunt now i didn't know what my father was thinking but my father took us inside the room where they try to save your life and then you die they leave you in a room and you know they just leave you on a gurney so he took us in, in inside there and it was one of the most gruesome sights i've ever seen in my life you know my aunt and mom were laying side by side they still had the two plastic tubes in their mouth where they were trying to give them oxygen but they were just filled all the way to the top with blood you know you couldn't even recognize my aunt and my mom from their body being so bruised and battered from that truck that hit them so once the truck hit him, you know, we automatically never went back to that house. My father told us, no one's going back to this house. No one's going to step in this house. You know, um, we're going to leave it just the way it is. So I was like, okay, you know, my father was my best friend, you know. And then about two weeks passed and my father started telling me that he couldn't accept what had happened. And my father was my best friend, so he used to share with me everything. So one night about... For about a month after it happened, he turns around and he tells me before we go to sleep, he tells me, tomorrow I'm going to kill myself. And the way he told me was more or less that he was going to check out. Those were the words he used. He told me, I'm going to check out. And I was already from my hood, 13 years old. I kind of knew what it meant, but I begged my father all night not to kill himself. But I knew he had his mind made up. The only thing I had asked him was, why did you come to this conclusion that you don't want to be on another one's on earth anymore you know you're gonna leave me and my brothers you're gonna leave me and my little brother who's gonna take care of us he shifted all of my older brother he said your older brother could take care of you and i said yeah but he's not my dad you know you're my dad you know i kind of was upset with him a long time because we seen the same thing and i live with the image in my head the same way he lived with the image in his head for a long time i was upset with my father because he did kill himself what he actually did the next day was he went and picked up about two grams of heroin he went to his best friend's house he told his friend to go to the bathroom and get some cottons or something. He drew up two full rigs of heroin and he slammed both of them. Um, they couldn't even save him. My homie's sister was a registered nurse. She was there at the house when it happened. She tried to save my father, but he was dead. And he killed himself 30 days exactly after my mother had got killed. But he had told me not to tell anybody. So I kept that secret for 20 years. I never told anybody that my father was gonna kill himself. I didn't tell his mother. I, I didn't tell my brothers and sisters, I didn't tell nobody. Cause my father was my best friend, you know, he more or less confided in me and he wanted me to hold that. And I held it for a lot of years, you know. When I did come out with it, eventually, my half my family stopped talking to me. They stopped talking to me for the simple fact that they said I knew and I should have told them, but you know, my father told me in confidence and I was gonna keep it to me, you know, and the only thing I understand is we've seen the same thing. And one guy had told me, one guy, one, one, one time before a guy, asked me if I knew what hell was. And I told him, yeah, you know, fire, grimstone, everything, you read the Bible. He's like, no. He goes, I want you to do something for me. He tells me, close your eyes. So I close mine. He goes, picture the most horrifying, gruesome thing you've ever seen. So I'm thinking, he goes, you got it? And I say, yeah, I got it. I pictured my mother and my aunt getting killed in front of me. Now, remember, I was walking with my mother and my aunt. My mother pushed me out the way and the car killed her and my aunt. The car was supposed to also kill me. So my mother saved my life, but I used to see the whole thing transpire right in front of me because it happened in front of me, maybe four feet in front of me when the truck hit my mother and my aunt. And it hit him very hard. The guy was driving a school district truck. He ran a red light on his, on his lunch break. He was drinking. They only gave the dude three years. He killed my aunt and my mom. He only got three years. He didn't even get a drunk driving. He just got vehicle manslaughter, but it was an accident, which he ran a red light. Yeah, my family sued, you know, for that. And me and my little, my, my brothers and sisters, we, you know, we got a settlement, you know, we get a lot of time, you know what I mean? And, you know, but it doesn't mean the fact that it brings back my mother. But the thing about it was, is the way I remember my mother is I never heard her cuss. 
They used to call her sister Mary. She went to church three times a week. So I wasn't too worried about where my mother went when she passed on because I knew she was going with who she believed in. But now my father's case was something totally different. You know, he was my homie. He was a heroin addict. He had tattoos. He ran around the hood. He drank a lot of Thunderbird. And I remember I used to wake up in the morning with him and he used to get 85 cents for a pack of Camel, not filter cigarettes. 98 cents for a bottle of Thunderbird, T-Bird. You know, he used to get a bottle of that. And then he used to get $25 for what they call a guchada, a spoon of heroin. But back then, I remember my father used to slam his heroin, and he'd only slam one time a day, just in the morning, and he would be set the whole day. Nowadays, you cannot, you have to slam like, get busy like five, six times a day. You gotta inject it like five, six times. Back when I used to see him, he used to get one spoon, 25 hours, and he used to last him all day. You know, so all through my life, my father was a heroin addict, and my mother didn't even use drugs. I guess you could say opposites attract. But I used to see my father come home, sometimes bloody, sometimes drunk, sometimes high on heroin. He's OD'd a few times, you know, but him and my mother were opposites. But when my mother got killed, my father couldn't accept the fact that he was going to be here alone. But the one mistake he made was he had told us nobody goes back to the house. Leave it as is, the way my mother had it and everything. Nobody went back, but he messed up and he went back by himself. He said that he went back to the house and he's laid in the bed that him and my mother laid in for 20 years. And he said he felt lonely, he couldn't take it without her. You know, I tried everything in the book to have him not kill himself, but I came from home from school the next day and I was at the park with my homies. I was already gang related, so we're running around smoking bud. And I remember my aunt came in her VW and she was crying and she wanted us to get in the car. And I didn't want to get in the car, you know? And she looked at me, she's like, get in the car, I need to tell you something. And I tell her, I already know, my father's dead. She looked at me and wonder how I knew, but my father had already told me previous that he was gonna kill himself. I just didn't know exactly what day. He waited for 30 days exactly, and he killed himself on that day. So I lost my mother one month, and then I lost my father the next month. So me and my little brother, we're worried about who is gonna raise us. That's when my grandmother stepped in and took the reins and raised me and my little brother. Mind the fact that she already had raised seven sons and all of them were from the hood except one of them. She had just finished raising, the youngest one was like 23 years old. But me and my little brother, we moved into my grandmother's house and we knew that this was the starting of our gang life. You know, because my uncles used to send us their clothes and we used to dress up because my grandmother wouldn't buy us no gang related clothes. Now for the first year we lived with her. She used to buy us tight ass jeans, tight ass shirts. She wanted us to dress different. And my uncles weren't allowing that, you know, because my uncles were prepping me and my little brother to be the next ones from the hood, along with maybe four or five of my cousins. There was about eight of us total from the family that were young and we were from the hood. But my uncles were prepping me and my little brother to be, you know, we could say maybe the most treacherous youngsters within our hood. And at that time, it, me and my little brother were we were putting the most work. We had the most dudes ducking and dodging. I mean, girls used to tell us in their hood when they heard we were coming, they would go and stash, they would go and hide, you know? And sometimes we weren't even going over there, but we were just putting in so much work that every hood was, a lot of hoods were fearing us. We wanted to be a hood star. What my little brother told me one time was he said, <clears throat> he goes, I'm kind of upset with God, you know? And I was like, okay, I understand, you know, but what do you mean? He's like, yeah, you know, God took my mom and my brother was the favorite of my mother. He said, yeah, God took my mom, you know, um, he told me, well, why don't we uh, try to overpopulate heaven, you know? And I was like, what? I thought I heard him wrong. And I said, what did you say? And he's like, let's, overpop let's overpopulate heaven. It's impossible, you can't do that, you know? Me and my little brother went on a spree where on, on our records, we've been picked up for like seven hot ones together, you know, and separate ones. But, you know, me and my little brother used to put in a lot of work and my little brother had the mentality that he actually thought that he was gonna overpopulate heaven. You know, he went to Hawaii when he was 14 years old for attempted murder, you know what I mean? And he got back out and we ran the streets again. And you know, we lived in my grandmother's house and my grandmother's house was like the main spot for our gang. You know, people used to come there to visit her, you know, come drop off things from my uncle. People used to go leave money, go leave, you know, food, dope. And my grandmother was like the main grandmother from the hood, you know what I mean? And they used to call her Big Al. She was also United Parents. Back then they had a United Parents where they used to get 
in the gangs and get the girls and guys and they would buy them jerseys and they would play softball. And she did that for like about 10 years, you know, and I remember I was, I was growing up as a youngster. I used to see my uncles and my aunts playing softball, you know what I mean? And I always was in my hood all the time, you know, and my family, there was seven of my aunts and seven of my uncles. And I think one of my aunts and one of my uncles wasn't from the hood, but the rest were and all their kids. So I was like a third generation in my family. The next generation was my child. My daughter was from my hood also. But we got prepped in a fashion where when we were nine, 10 years old, we got sat down. The first thing we were told is never tell. You know, we were taught, we were embedded in us that never tell, never call the cops. You know, I called the cops one time because my car got stolen. But it took me three hours just to pick up the phone and call them because I never called the cops. I was always the one to do, I am the cops. If something would happen with my family or something would take place with, with us, I would take care of it. I wouldn't call the law. I was the law. I had a gun just like them, but I wouldn't have to abide by rules like that. You know what I mean? And my family, once I turned 16, I was the sole provider for my whole family. So growing up in my grandmother's house, you know, we knew the rules to go by when we needed to be in, you know, and a lot of times when my mother and father were alive, there was times when me and my little brother wouldn't even come home for two days. And we were like nine and 10 years old, 10 and 11 years old. When we got to my grandmother's, it was the same way because of the fact that her house was open like all night. You know, I remember they used to play poker on her table, her and all her friends, a couple of my aunts and uncles, and there used to be like 10 of them, you know, and then we used to go into the back door and sneak in weed, we're sneaking in guns, you know. My grandmother used to wake up in the morning and she used to walk around the yard and she would just collect guns. One time I see her walking with like six guns, two rifles, a shotgun, and she collected these just out of our yard at home because we used to set the guns by, you know, by the bricks, by the bush, you know, because people used to shoot at our house all the time, so we used to always shoot back. As we got a little older, we started realizing how my uncles were doing it, where they stashed the guns, where they stashed the dope, and my house was really, really active. We used to get raided a lot. You know, the FBI was on my family because of my uncles and the feds, and he was doing his thing, and you know, it was really, really heat on my house, but at the same time, we used to put in a lot of work. We used to go do a lot of things to a lot of people. You know, we used to break windows in people's houses. We used to throw cocktails at people's houses. You know, we'd fill a bottle up with gas put a fuse in there, light it and throw it on people's cars. But I didn't realize until later in life that my grandmother looked at me better than she looked at anybody else. You know, I kind of figured she was always on me, you know what I mean, but she always used to tell me things like, I remember one time I was in jail and I called home and I asked my grandmother about my uncle because she told me that she had got a letter from my uncle and I told her, oh yeah, you know, how's he doing? He had had 399 years with a life sentence in the feds. How many years? 399 with a life sentence. My uncle, he was one of those guys, but he had, he had 300 year, 399 years with a life sentence on top of that. And he was in the, he was in Marion, Illinois, three floors underground, you know what I mean? And he, you know, he was a real, real treacherous guy. And um, I remember I called her on the phone one time from jail and I asked her, you know, how does he look? She said, pues muy matón, que mas? And my grandmother just answered the question with like a straight killer, what else do you think? Now, I knew what my family was about when my grandmother answered that question. I asked her how was her son, and she said, well, he looks like a real killer, what do you think? Now, coming from my grandmother, talking about her son like that, I knew what type of family I was involved in when I heard that out of my grandmother's mouth, because that's her own son. For her to say, well, he looks like a straight killer, what else do you think, showed me that my grandmother knew what time it was all the way around. You know what I mean? To say sad about your son takes a lot, but my grandmother was just stating what my uncle really was. Because as I was growing up also, my grandfather fooled around on my grandmother. My grandmother found out and jumped in front of a car. She tried to kill herself, in other words. When my uncle found out, my uncle sent word back to my grandmother if she wanted her husband took out. Now that's coming from his son, you know, and I caught wind of it because I was there and I heard my grandma's conversation and I heard my grandma say that her son got out and asked her if he would take out his own dad due to the fact that his dad was fooling around on his mother. So then I knew what time it was with my uncle. I just found out how my grandmother was, but now I found out how my uncle was. So I knew I had to tread lightly when I did things in my neighborhood. I knew I had to keep my mouth shut never say a word to the cop, you know what I mean? Ask for a lawyer, just hush up, don't say shit. You know what I mean? Because they, they lace us up from A to Z. 
You know, I had uncles that showed me how to do this. I had an uncle show me how to do this. One showed me how to do drugs. One showed me how to take guns apart. One told me how jail was going to be. You know, I already knew that I was destined for prison. All my family knew that we were destined for prison because of the fact that that's the way it went. Juvenile hall, juvenile camp, YA prison. And we all went through those steps. And, you know, we used to have get togethers at my house, at my, at my grandmother's house. And that's when all my family was together. And I would see all my uncles, you know, they had frogs on them, you know, they've been from the hood 20, 30 years. And, you know, I used to look at them and I used to idolize them. You know, I used to watch the way they walked, what kind of clothes they wore, you know, what kind of drugs they did. And I wanted to be just like them. I had nothing else in life. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be a cop. I didn't want to be a fireman. No, I wanted to be a cholo. I wanted to wear a hairnet. I wanted to wear big old pants where you miss the first buckle, you go to the second buckle and bring them in. I used to be like, I used to have a waist, like a 26 waist, and I used to wear like a fight, uh, size 48 Levi's. Now, the 48s are really, really big, you know what I mean? So I used to miss the first buckles and pull in from the second buckles. And we're talking about size 48 pants, Levi's. I used to wear that. I used to wear maybe like a 2X sweater. You know, last of, last of the cholos that wore a hairnet was my generation. You know, we used to wear a hairnet, a beanie, you know what I mean? I already had my teardrop on my face. So, you know, we were gang related from when we were very, very young. I remember exactly when I got in my hood. It was the summer of the seventh grade. You know, we had just got out of school, you know, it was summertime. We got bored and we were like, we're running around all these cities and nobody had youngsters. We didn't even have youngsters. I think the youngest guy from my hood was 23. So me and my little brother and my homies, we started my hood back to life. Now we thrive strong. We're one of the most deepest in Southeast LA. There's a lot of us, but back then there was only seven youngsters. And we took on the role of keeping the hood alive. So we kept the hood alive. I know every, all, all seven, I knew their name, where they were from. I grew up with these guys and maybe out of seven of us, there's only two of us that are still active. The rest, a couple of them died, a couple of them were doing life, and a couple of them just gave up. They don't want no part of nothing anymore. And I respect that, you know, I think I'm the only one now that's still active. I'm 46 years old and I'm still active. I don't mean I'm out there gang banging and shooting at people. But, you know, I gotta be careful because along the way I know I made a lot of enemies. I might not be an enemy of this guy that's gangbanging in his hood today, but I might have shot his brother when I was a youngster. I might have put in work and my homies probably smoked one of his brothers. So he's taking it to heart. There's been situations where I've seen a dude and he wants to kill me and I don't even know this guy. The next thing I find out that I stabbed his brother when I was 17 years old. This was 20 years ago, but due to the fact that I did some harm to somebody's family, it still runs in the blood, you know? So I gotta be careful these days when I'm right here in downtown or I'm walking the streets, I gotta be careful that some youngsters don't just come up from behind and cap me, shoot me in the back of the head because I did something to his brother previous. Also, I used to be with a lot of women and I had a lot of problems like that with their boyfriends, their brothers, because I used to be with women that were from enemies of mine because I used to want to pump up for information. One of my uncles schooled me in that fashion. He said, if you want information on somebody else's hood, be with their homegirls. They'll tell you everything about their hood. And sure enough, that's what I did. But also I've been set up seven times by women. I've been stuck in a house where they surrounded the whole house. And the only way I heard them was I heard, I was laying with this girl and I heard outside the window, shh, he's inside. I heard this through the window. Now, I remember previous, this girl had showed me her dad's Mossberg shotgun that he had in the closet. So what I did was I went in the closet, grabbed the Mossberg, cocked it, went to the front window and shot one time out the front window. By the time I got outside, all these guys were gone. But I knew that the broad had set me up. So I waited a few months and I set her right back up. She ended up getting two of her cheekbones busted. She got her leg busted, her, el her elbow busted, like four of her front teeth knocked out. They drug her for like about 15 feet on the side of the car. You know, she was really messed up, but she had set me up the same fashion. Because, you know, I was doing a lot of shit out there and putting in a lot of work in other hoods, and I was like on the top of their list to get taken care of. They were even rolling around and said they killed me already. I mean, like four different times, they said, ain't you dead? I thought the guys from so-and-so said they killed you. And I was like, man, they're saying they killed me. I'm right here, you know, they ain't killed nobody. But it was just the fact that I used to synchronize and go to a certain hood. I'd make it like five times a day, 
No, your average guy would go maybe once or twice. I would go five times a day, all times a day. I would hit him at six in the morning, 12 in the afternoon, three in the afternoon, six in the evening, and midnight. I would just hit him left and right. I'd go, I'd go, I'd go. And mainly I'd go, and then we had the master key to all Toyota Celicas from 87 all the way to 90. We had the master key. And the master key, you just open the door. Same key for the door and the ignition. So we never pulled the ignition. We just had a shoe box of keys. And before we left the house, one or two keys, and we'd stick them in the pocket. If we got stranded way over there, far away, we just walk down the street, look for a Celica. Didn't matter what it looked like. We'd get in it, the key. Open the door, start the ignition, it would be gone. I mean, I stole so many Toyota <laughs> Celicas. Yeah, that it was pitiful. That's how I learned how to drive. A stick shift was by burning like three clutches. But I learned. I was only 13 years old and I'm over there driving a stick shift. I remember I stole this one Salica. It was so nice one time. And we were walking from far and I told my homegirl, you know what? I'm gonna steal this car right here. So I ended up stealing the car. We all got in. And I remember I got to a stoplight and a cop hit the lights behind me. Boom. And I told my, it was me, my homegirl, my homeboy, my homeboy, my homegirl, my homeboy, six of us in a little cell And my homegirls, they were pretty big girls. You know, they were, they were called the cheeseburger sisters. So you could imagine they were big ass bitches. And they, they used to be the, 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 the gorilla gang because they used to beat guys up, you know what I mean? So they're in the car, the cop gets behind me, he hits the lights, I hit the gas, boom. So we're going down the main street. We're coming up to a red light. I tell my homies, homegirls, Duck, I'm running this red light. So every red, I hit like six red lights. Every time I came to a red light, all I would do was hit the gas, duck my head down, and go through the red light without even looking. I did that for six lights. I remember we came all the way from Uptown Whittier, all the way to Norwalk, and there's nothing but, we hit nothing but red lights, but I stopped for no lights at all. I just, as soon as we were gonna come to the intersection, I would just tell everybody to get down and I would put my head down and would just go straight through. I didn't want to see no car coming to hit me, nothing. So we went through sick lights. What ended up happening is I'm coming down the street and there's many, there's little streets cutting off to the side. So what happens is I want to cut down one of these little streets and get away. But as I turn the car to cut down this street to my left, there's so much weight in the car that the, the car locks up and I slide up a curve into a feed store where they sell chickens, rabbits. I killed the gang of rabbits, killed the gang of chickens because I went inside the feed store. When I went inside the feed store, I remember coming to and the car smoking and everything. My homegirl is leaned over the dashboard on top of the hood. My homie seen shotgun, he has a crack in his forehead. I hit both my knees right here, hit my chest on the steering wheel. So we grab my homegirl from the hood and we pull her back, glass and everything. We pull her back and when we pull her back, she has a cut like about this long, all the way on the top of her head, it's just open. I remember looking at her and she tells me, run homie, run. And I'm like, oh shit. So I grab my gun from the bottom of the seat. I climb out the, the driver window and I take off running. I remember I'm running and I stash behind this lady's wall. So I'm listening to see what I'm hearing. I'm breathing hard. I'm trying to control my breath because I'm so tired from running from the cops. But then I hear, like a tick, 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 tick. And then I hear, and I'm like, oh, fuck. I don't remember there being a dog anywhere in here. So I peep out like that. What is it? It's a canine. I see the cop right behind him and it's a big ass German Shepherd. So I take off running the opposite way. The only thing I can hide under, I see a UPS van. So I get under the UPS van and I'm hiding under the UPS van and here comes the dog. I see him coming. I'm like, oh shit. But what happens is the dog runs right up to the UPS van, looks dead at me, and then starts running around the UPS van. Now I found out afterwards that the reason the dog didn't come and get me is because he could no longer smell my scent. I guess the fumes from the UPS van being running, he could smell my scent all the way to where he ran up. But I'm telling you, I'm laying in the UPS van and he's looking directly at me. I'm thinking he's gonna come bite my face. No, he runs around the van, runs around the, the UPS van. When he gets to that corner, I run out the other way. So I'm running and I hear him running out of the driveway and I hear him right behind me. I can hear his nails hitting the ground, like a, you know, like a horse. And I'm like, oh shit. I go into a backyard and there's a fence, then a wall. I climb up the fence, I grab the wall, pick myself up. He tries to jump and get me, he can't jump that wall. So I'm like, I'm good. Well, when I jumped down the wall from the other side, when I landed, mind you, when I hit the steering wheel, my da the dashboard hit both my knees and split them. So when I hit the grass, 
I fell to the ground, boom. And now I couldn't, I don't know, my legs had went out, I guess, from the impact of the crash. So I'm in this backyard, I hear the dog bark, barking on the other side. Then I don't hear him barking anymore, so I'm dragging myself through the grass. While my homie that was sitting shotgun, he had ran the other way. I guess when we ran, I ran this way, he ran that way, but we circled around and met up in the same backyard, the one I was dragging myself through. So my homie came out of the bushes, he's like, what's wrong? I told him, I can't, I can't walk, help me out. Stash me somewhere, you know? So he grabbed me, he pulled me, he put me under a pool table in somebody's backyard in their patio. I'm under the pool table and I remember, I'm trying to catch my breath, I'm trying to, and then all of a sudden, through that blue tarp, the dog just busted through, boom, and grabbed me by my arm. Ooh. So he started biting my arm, and I remember he was biting my arm, and I'm looking, and he's just pulling my skin. You know, all these holes on my arm right here, all these are from canine, you know, so he's biting me, he's biting me. So after he tried to bite me in my neck, I put my hand up, he bit me one time in this hand. Well, he bit me in this hand, I grabbed him by his snout, by his nose and top teeth, and then I grabbed his bottom teeth, and I was just gonna try to rip his mouth because he already had bit me numerous times. You know, he, he bit me all in this arm, he bit me like three times in this arm. My arm was leaking everywhere, I had those blood everywhere. But as soon as I grabbed him and I was gonna rip his mouth open, I remember, leave my dog alone him. Hit me in the back of the head, knocked me out on the cement floor that I was on under, by, by the side of the pool table. When I came to, I hear the cop asking me where my homie was. Now my homie, mind you, was right in his garage door right here. Because I was in the patio, he went in the garage door and left me under the pool table. Well, as soon as he was asking me for my homie, he had the canine snapping at my face. Now I was in handcuffs. Some lady comes out of her house that owns that house and she tells the cop, leave him alone, he's just a child. I was only 14 years old. So I can imagine how small I looked to all these grown men with a dog biting the shit out of me. So I didn't give up my homie. What does he do? He lets the dog go on me again. So now the dog bites my leg, tears me two big old holes in my leg because I couldn't do anything. I was handcuffed. So he's, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, man. I'm asking, begging him to get the dog off me. Five minutes, about five minutes, three, four, five minutes later, another dog comes through the gate. He's on my homie's scent. So my homie scream, hear me screaming and yelling. The dog runs up to the door. I can hear my homie on the other side of the door saying, I'm coming out. Too late, when he opened that door, that dog jumped up, hit him in his chest. My homie fell and I heard my homie scream. I've never heard a man scream like that in my life. That dog bit the shit out of him and tore up both his legs. Well, you know, the one thing my homie told me when we got busted, because they took us to the general hospital, they put us on the 13th floor of the jail ward. First they took us to the Pico hospital, fixed it up, then they sent us to the jail ward in, in, in uh, USC, uh, the general hospital alley, downtown general, and they put us in the 13th floor in the jail ward. You had to be 16 years old and up to go in the jail ward. Put us in the jail ward, I remember my homie looked over and leaned over and looked at me and said, man, you didn't even give me up when that dog was biting you. He said, I would have gave you up. If the dog would have bit me the way it was biting me, I would have told him exactly where you were at. He goes, but Johnny, you never told him where I was at. See, I wasn't even tripping that my homie was in the garage and he could hear everything. Cause they kept asking me, where's your homie? Where's your homie? I didn't give him up. They let the dog go and the dog started biting me again. They were still asking me, where's your homie? And I didn't, I didn't know, I knew where he was, but Remember, I was schooled a long time ago not to ever tell on anybody in general. Don't sign no papers, don't talk to nobody, just... And I remember my homie leaned over and he told me that. And he goes, you didn't even break, man, when they had the canine biting you. And I was like, nah, I wasn't gonna break. So what happened was I couldn't sue him or nothing because there were people sheriffs, they let the dog go. I got a high pursuit chase after a shooting. They tried to put the shooting and me together, high speed chase, I wrecked. My home goes didn't press no charges. One broke her pelvis in the back, she limps today. Another one has a big old scar on her forehead. But my older brother ended up marrying their older sister, so they're part of the family. But that was one time when, you know, the cops chased me, sick the canines on me, and I knew they were playing for keeps then, you know what I mean? I knew that it was on and popping, you know? After that, if I seen a cop pull up with a canine in his car, oh, I wasn't trying to run. No, I, I wasn't trying, you can't outrun a dog, you know, especially the canine. If they're on your scent, they'll cut through anything, they'll climb walls, they'll did, jump did fences. Did you do any prison time for that? No, I did camp time for that. Camp time, yeah. I went to camp for that, and then my uncle went to camp, did a year, my other uncle did a year, and I did nine months in camp for that alone. You know, they tried to get me for the shooting, they couldn't place it, the time was messed up, so they just got me for the GTA. But I already had seven GTAs prior. I had a total of 11 GTAs when I went to camp. Oh, well, yeah, we had the master card to Toyota Salica, so yeah, yeah. we used to, and we used to steal all of them. 
Some of them would be run down, you know, and cheap. Some would be nice ass cars with systems. You know, we found so many things inside them. We found guns inside them. We found dope inside them, money inside them. You know, we, we all kinds of power tools, you know, everything you could think of inside a car. You know what I mean? And we used to take these cars and we just take everything out of them, use them to go do some shootings and then leave the car there. I so, burned so many clutches, you know, it was pitiful, you know. So earlier I interrupted you when you were telling the story about was your grandfather and you had the bullet hole that went through the house? Yeah, what yeah. happened was the guy came and shot with a 30-30 and those bullets are like three and a half inches long. And my grandfather, when he said, look through the hole in the front yard and I could see the dogs in the backyard playing, he meant it sarcastically, but you can actually see all the way to the backyard. And my house sits down here and there's a hill that comes down. So the guy shot from an angle. The same guy, I went and broke his windows and shot at him the day before the previous day. But before that day, he went and broke all my homegirl's windows. So what it was is he broke my homegirl's windows. She came to me and told me I went and broke his windows, shot at his house. And then the following day, he came and shot at my house. Well, that's the day my grandfather found out that I was doing the dirt. And as he was talking shit, hating me, I remember telling him, just read your paper like you do every morning. Because he was telling me, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? I told him, just read my paper. Just read the paper every morning. Well, about a month later, I remember my grandmother gets him his paper, hands him the paper. Now, mind you, I've been home for like three days. I ain't went nowhere. So he gets his paper. He's looking. He's reading it. And then I remember he stops. He looks up at me. He looks down at his paper. He drops his paper. And he never talked to me again. Ever. And my grandmother, my grandfather raised me and my little brother, you know, he just never spoke with me ever. When I went to prison and in court, he went to every court date, but he never spoke with me. He never spoke to me, not a word. I guess my grandfather was upset because he actually felt that I was the one that wasn't out there hurting people, shooting people. But little did he know I was the main one. But when he found out, he blamed himself because he remembers the day that he took me and showed me those bullet holes in his house and told me that I wasn't doing shit about it. So when he read his paper and he looked at me, he put two and two together. And my grandmother told me after years that he was acting like that, that the reason he talked to me because he felt that it was his fault that I ended up the way I ended up. Because I was him sitting in prison and he felt that it was his fault. Which it wasn't his fault at all. I was going to go back anyways. That was my thing. We're going to go back and forth, back and forth till one of us can't come back no more. But the thing about it was is that now I had to remember this dude shooting in my house with 30-30 and it's going through every wall. So he's not going to get somebody. So. I ended up getting this dude, putting him in the hospital, and he never came back again. I think I seen him previous, like 10 years ago, and he walks all messed up, you know what I mean? He got shot really, really bad. You know, he was the one that I made pop lock on the floor. What I mean by pop lock is, I had a 22 rifle that shot 38 rounds, and there were 22 bullets. And the way, when you hit somebody, you hit them so much that they actually look like they're pop locking because you're just shaking everywhere, you know? And I said, let's go make a full pop lock. And I used to make food, pop, I used to let the whole clip up and watch a guy pop lock, you know? And then when they hit the ground, you hit them on the ground, now they're breakdancing because they're spinning, you know? A lot of people would spin, you know? So we would clown like that and say, hey, let's go make somebody pop lock. And I remember I had that 22 rifle. I saw the front of it all. It had a banana clip. 38 rounds. I remember I used to be there. My finger used to get tired from just pulling and pulling and pulling. And I had that 22 rifle for life. Ooh, shit. Like two years I had it. And it saved my life a lot of times. It got me a lot of money. You know, it was like right there at the right time, all the time. I never got caught with it. That gun ended up, I ended up trading it with somebody for, for another gun. You know, because I used to go like all the way to Compton and trade those guys for their guns. We used to trade guns. I used to give them all my hot shit and they would give me all their hot shit. So if we got caught down here in Southeast LA with a gun that's wanted over there in South Central, well, they're not going to place us with anything over there because we got it over here. So we used to trade with guys. Every month we used to do it. I used to have it like clockwork. You know, we used to trade it where dudes used to come with like four of them. I would trade them four for four. You know, and it didn't matter what make it was or anything, just four for four. And it didn't matter how many murders they had on the gun, how many shootings it had. That didn't matter. We were just trading. And I was doing that with the guys from Mexicali, with the guys from SGV. And I got that idea from one of my homies that I looked up to. He was one of the most treacherous homies I had, you know, and he was the only one that could come and get artillery after I used it. Because once I used it, I didn't want to give it up. But they used to send my homie to come and get it for me because he was the only one that could get it for me, you know. And I wasn't giving it up. That was just the way it was. I'm not going to go play something in your hand that I used last weekend. Because they'll catch you with it, but they're going to link it back to me. Because 
nine times out of ten, most people are gonna say what the cop wants to hear when they have them in that interrogation room. I've been slapped, I've been spit at, I've been grabbed by my throat, grabbed by my hair. By cops? Yeah, by the cops in the interrogation room. You know, because I wouldn't say nothing. You know what I mean? When I was a youngster, I remember I got arrested and I said a few words and the cop changed everything up. It made me look like the bad guy. So I knew now when I got arrested, no matter what it was for, I ain't got a word to say, nothing. But I mean, some of those cops would get mad, those detectives, and they'd actually grab you by your throat and grab you by your mouth, you know what I mean? And try to choke you on a chair, you know? And I know somebody's looking through that glass, but they ain't telling this grown man to stop whooping on me. I'm only like 15, 16 years old, and this dude's putting hands on me. I knew something was wrong, but at the same time, they wanted my family and me and my brother so bad because we were doing so much shit that they just couldn't pin it. They couldn't place it, but they knew that we were coming out that house and we were selling a lot of drugs. We were, in other words, we were making the hood thrive, you know, because we we're just doing it. There was a lot of us. You know, it was like a total of 15 of us, you know, my uncles and my cousins, and we we're all from the hood. So, you know, I was never short without a homie. You know what I mean? I always had a cousin, and he's my homeboy. You know, when we went to school over here. I had a, my cousin going with me or my brother going with me. So I was never really alone until that one time when I was alone out there for the summer. And that was the most treacherous time in my life. You know, I did so much shit that summer where, you know, my homies didn't even tell me anything anymore. They used to just come, drop me off an ounce of dope, trade the guns, and just leave. They wouldn't tell me, oh, you need to go over here. They used to scold my other homies and I'd be sitting by myself just listening to them because they couldn't tell me shit. Because I was doing more than half my homies that were already from the hood put in work. When they were youngsters, I already had surpassed them. I went way past them. You know, and my hood was very, very, uh, uh, what you call, they're very online with their rules. We had certain rules. We couldn't get a frog on our skin unless we earned it first. You know, when we put the hood, we didn't put no click. We just put the hood, no click. You know, um, we're, we were made to not say anything to anybody, not to spread no kind of rumors, not to talk about anybody, not, not to say anybody's a rat without having black and white. Never put any type of blame on anybody unless we had paperwork in front of us. And you couldn't be from my hood unless you were raised in, bred in and raised there or you have family members. Other than that, you couldn't be from the hood. And it was so family orientated that it was just families and we were all from the same hood. But I'm talking about moms, kids, and then their kids, you know, we went generations. So we're embedded with everything my uncles had. All my uncles had been to prison already. They already had dealt drugs, you know what I mean? They already ran around the hood. So we just stepped right in and we were laced up as we went along. I mean, we had the best threads, man. I remember as people used to see me dressed all bond and they used to be like, how the fuck did you get that clothes, you know? And I wouldn't tell them what's my uncle's shit. I would tell them, oh, I went and bought it in East LA, but it was passed down from my uncles. You know, Charlie Brown shirts, big old khakis, you know, Pendleton's. You know, they gave us so much shit that you know, my grandmother couldn't help but going to the swap it the next time and saying, just grab what you want, you know, because it wouldn't matter. She would buy us what, we, what she would want us to wear. And my uncles would see us and say, you're not wearing that. Here, wear this, you know what I mean? So he would give us other shit. And I mean, we, I felt good. So I thought I'd be so on rude where I'd be the center of attention and I loved it. You know what I mean? They were like, what do you get these clothes at, man? And my uncles, they just had closets full, closets full. You know what I mean? Like each day. I don't think I wore the same thing once a month. I had so much in, you know, there's so many other things that, you know, I did with them, you know, and I, I'll share with you, you know, my uncles took me on missions, you know, they took me on my first mission to earn my teardrop. I was only 14, gonna be 15. And they showed me the deed before I did the deed, you know, they showed me the DB, but they did. You know, my older brother did the deed, couldn't handle it. Got out the gang right when he did it. He did it and just changed up from being this guy that was treacherous and to be in the guy of the straight pussy and disrespected. I guess he couldn't handle the deed. He did what he had to do and then he felt bad about it. You, you, you know? Give me that story next time. Yeah, I'll give you that one. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, I got some good shit for you, man. I've been thinking <laughs> you, you. all the time, some good shit, you know?